Okay, so today's daf is Kuf Lamed Gimel. We're going to start at the top of Kuf Lamed Gimel Amud Aleph, four lines from the top, Amar Mar, where it says the master said, now this is going back to what we said yesterday, which is um, situations where Brit Milah has to override other mitzvot. So the most common one that we're familiar with, of course, is when a Brit Milah falls out on Shabbat. Of course, Brit Milah is performed on Shabbat. But the other case that the Talmud is dealing with here is, what about when somebody has Tzara'at? They have what we would call in our terms leprosy. It's not really leprosy, but some kind of a skin discoloration that there's a halacha that you're not allowed to remove that skin discoloration. Even if you live in LA and you have the best plastic surgeon in the world or the best dermatologist, you're not allowed to remove it because only the Kohen, you know, the Kohen has to be able to see it and declare whether it's pure or impure. And you're not allowed to cut it off of you. So the problem is what if somebody has uh, tzara'at right in the place of the Brit Milah? So how are they going to do a Brit Milah without violating the commandment of removing the Tzara'at? Okay, that was the issue yesterday. And we're going to continue with that a little bit. So Amar Mar, the master said, Basar, Af al The Pasuk says, Basar, or Besar or Lato. The flesh of the foreskin has to be removed. Even if there is a Baharet, even if there is Tzara'at there, Yimoli still has to perform the circumcision. This is what Rabbi Yoshia says. Halem Lama Likra. So the Gemara asks, why do I need a pasuk to tell me that Brit Milah should override the prohibition on cutting off the Tzara'at? Davar she'en mitzkavenhu. Davar she'en mitzkaven mutar. Really, this is not intentional. In other words, when you, when you cut the uh, foreskin, to remove the foreskin, your purpose is not to remove Tzara'at. Your purpose is to circumcise somebody. So you don't care what's there. So why is that considered a violation of the prohibition if it's not in your intention to do so? So Amar Abaye says, So Abaye gives the simplest answer, which is that this statement is only necessary for Rabbi Yehuda. Because as we learned throughout Masechet Shabbat so far, Rabbi Yehuda says, Davar Asur. Normally, even something you don't intend is prohibited. So therefore, if we didn't know that there was a special verse allowing us to perform circumcision when Tzara'at would be removed, even though it's not your intention, it would still be prohibited, according to Rabbi Yehuda. That's why he needs this extra pasuk to teach you that, in fact, you're allowed to do the circumcision, even though this unintended result is going to occur. And Rava Amar Rava says, No, Afilu Tema Rabbi Shimon, Mode Rabbi Shimon, Bipasek Reshe, Velo Yamut. Even Rabbi Shimon, who generally allows you to do an action where an unintended result will occur. In other words, for example, he allows you to drag a chair along the ground even though it might dig a hole in the ground on Shabbat. Or he allows you to do, um, he d- allows you to do activity A, which is permitted, even though activity B might occur as an unintended result. But he would agree even here that it's a problem. Why? Because even Rabbi Shimon agrees that where the result is inevitable, you are responsible for it. So in this case, when you perform the circumcision and in the, and on the foreskin is tzara'at, okay, is this discoloration, this leprosy. So by its very nature, there's no way you can separate the two actions. It's like we say, you can't say cut the chicken's head off and keep it alive. That's impossible. So, so too here, you cannot do action A without also simultaneously doing action B. So even Rabbi Shimon, who generally is liberal about issues or lenient about the issue of uh, unintended consequences, is here going to hold you responsible for it. And that's why even he needs a special dispensation to allow you to perform a circumcision where the inevitable result will be the removal of tzara'at. Okay? So now the Gemara asks... Uh, so, uh, if that's the case, let but doesn't Abaye agree with this idea that according to Rabbi Shimon, inevitable consequences are always factored in. You're always liable for inevitable consequences. It was actually Abaye and Rava that said together that Moder Rabbi Shimon that. Rabbi Shimon agrees when consequences are inevitable that you're responsible for them. So why didn't he mention that? In other words, Abaye comes along and says that the only person who's going to have a problem with the circumcision that removes Tara'at is Rabbi Yehuda. Because Rabbi Yehuda is the one who's concerned with things that happen that are not your intention. He says you're still responsible for them even though you didn't intend them. So then Ravah says, no, what do you mean? But, okay, it, the, the argument is really because if there weren't uh, a Tara'at, okay, okay. okay, if let's say uh, uh, Brit Mila was not, you know, did not override Shabbat, 
Okay, you'd still be uh, violating Shabbat by cutting, whether it's right or not. Right, so forget Shabbat. We're not talking about Shabbat. So now. Shabbat right. so you, you, you know, you, Everybody agrees on that one. On, on that one. So the argument is whether when there is a tarat, that makes the, that, that, that overturns the overriding. Like, in other words, right. now it becomes more. Well, maybe the only dispensation is Shabbat, it. but, you know, this is a different violation. That was the whole concern before. In other words, the whole machloket in yesterday's daf was, the whole issue in yesterday's daf was, what's more stringent, sara'at or shabbat? Maybe even though shabbat is, you're allowed to do brit, you're, you're not allowed they, to do sara'at. They establish that, you know, cutting, you have to do it, that's more important and, than shabbat. Than, 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 than shabbat right. right? But if there's sara'at, is it. <laughs> right, that's a question. Now it's a question, right? right. right. Yeah. Separate question. So the question is, since it's not intended, but it is inevitable, okay? So originally, Abaye thought that as long as it's unintended, it's not an issue. For Rabbi Shimon. But for Rabbi Yehuda, it's an issue. So he needs a special verse to allow you to do the Brit Milah when the unintended <laughs> removal of Tarat is going to occur. But then Rava says, no, even Rabbi Shimon is going to say it's an issue. Because even though Rabbi Shimon generally doesn't care about things that are unintentional, here it's inevitable. So even Rabbi Shimon is going to say that you're responsible normally and you need a special dispensation to be able to do the Brit Milah that's going to remove, remove the Tzara'at. So then the Gemara says, but Abaye himself agrees that Rabbi Shimon holds you responsible for inevitable consequences. So why did he say that only Rabbi Yehuda needs a verse to permit circumcision that's going to remove Tzara'at? Because even Rabbi Shimon should need it. Everybody should need it because it's an inevitable consequence. So it's significant according to everyone. So the answer is, basically, that Batar de Shema'amirava Sivara. After Abaye heard this insight from Rava, that's when he accepted it. So the original conversation that they had, where Abaye said that the only person who's going to have a problem with a circumcision that removes Tara'at is Rabbi Yehuda. That was before he heard from Rava, no, that even Rabbi Shimon says inevitable consequences are a liability. But once he heard it, he accepted it too. So in the end, even he agrees. Everybody, no matter what they, the view is of unintentional consequences, this is not really an unintentional consequence because this is a consequence that's inevitable. So you're held responsible for it. And therefore, you're going to need a special verse to allow circumcision that inevitably removes tzara'at. You're held responsible because it's inevitable. Because it's inevitable. You know it's inevitable. Right. You know, we're assuming. We're assuming you do. Yeah. So, uh, aha. So there are some who take this argument of Abaye and Rava and apply it to a different situation. It says, You have to guard the Tzara'at. If a person has this discoloration on their skin called Tzara'at, which we call leprosy, just as a matter of convenience, but it's not really leprosy. So it says, To guard it and to do. Meaning, you can't do, you can't remove it actively, but you can accidentally Accidentally, in other words, you can create a situation where the tzara'at will get rubbed off your skin. Like, let's say you have a very tight sieve. You, take, you tie your shoe on with uh, some kind of a leaf that's going to be abrasive and rub, it off, rub that part of your skin off. L- rub that top la- layer of your skin off. You can put it on there. And even though you know that over time it might rub it off, that's not your reason. You're tying your shoe. Or, let's say you're carrying something on your arm with a heavy, uh, a heavy backpack or a heavy stick on your arm. So, you, you don't have to say, well, I can't carry it on this arm because I have tzara'at and it might rub the tzara'at off. It's okay. You can put it on there. Because it's not your intention to rub the tzara'at off. You really just want to carry something on your arm and it might rub the tzara'at off. It's okay. Okay, so that's what, that's what, the, what the Torah says. So, ve'im avra, avra. And if the, if the tzara'at falls away, it falls off. That's it. So, so again, we have the same question. Why do I need a verse to tell me that I can carry a heavy load on my arm even though it might rub the tzara'at off? It's davar sheinu mitkaven. It's not intended. I didn't want to rub the tzara'at. I'm not trying to rub the tzara'at off. I just want an arm to carry my bag on and I happen to have some tzara'at over there and now I can't use that arm just because I have the, uh, just because I have the tzara'at on there. It's not fair. So, Amar uh, Abaye said, Again, Abaye says, now, and in this version, Abaye is saying, when did the when did the pasuk, in other words, who is bringing the pasuk to teach you that you're allowed to carry a heavy bag on your arm or a uh, stick on your arm, even though it might rub the tzara'at off? Or you're allowed to tie a reed around your foot, even though it might rub tzara'at off over time? Who is the one that needs that special dispensation? Rabbi Yehuda. Because Rabbi Yehuda is the one that says that, nor- that unintentional things are still your responsibility. 
So, but then, uh, then Rabbi comes and says, "Rabbi Amar Afilu Tamer Rabbi Shimon." What Rabbi Shimon be pasuk Rishi Velo Yamut? Okay, that Rava comes along and says, "No, even Rabbi Shimon, who normally says like you can scratch your head like this on Shabbat, no problem, even though you might have hair come out because you didn't intend for the hair to come out, right?" Rabbi Shimon is normally lenient about unintentional things, but if it's inevitable. Like in this case, if you put a heavy load on your arm, inevitably it's going to rub some of it off. That's the thought, okay? What? In sign was inevitable before. You said maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't. That's not your intention. In other words, okay. So now the Gemara is assuming it is in- it's, it's inevitable. Uh, yeah, it's inevitable. Yeah. What is the I, difference? I mean, in, 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 in the yeah. seek ratio, when you, cut, when you cut the chicken's head off, Right. It it's inevitable. It's, it's 100% right, inevitable. Right, inevitable. But if you sling a bag over your shoulder, right, it doesn't it's not, it's not seem guaranteed. It's right, this case, this story. case definitely doesn't seem inevitable to to my mind. But they're assuming that it is. Okay, uh, why is it? Uh, why is it assumed presumed to be inevitable? I'm not sure. Because and, and what would the proof be actually that you would one would would tend to assume it isn't inevitable? Because look, it says. Im avra avra. If it if it wipes off, it wipes away. Right. right? So it, it doesn't sound like it means inevitable, but maybe. But the point is that in a case, let's say, in other words, the original statement perhaps wasn't talking about in a case of inevitability. But in a case where it were inevitable, in a case where it is actually inevitable, there even Rabbi Shimon will need a special dispensation. Let's put it that way. Okay. So, but still, doesn't Abaye hold of this idea that inevitable consequences are your responsibility? So the same idea. In other words, um, same answer. That originally Abaye didn't have this distinction. That Rabbi Shimon only is lenient where it's not inevitable. Uh, where it's inevitable, he's stringent. And then when he heard it from Rava, then he accepted it. So now he holds that inevitable consequences you are, you are responsible for. And therefore he will require a dispensation for the person in this case if they're carrying something that will inevitably rub the tzara'at off. Okay. So now, Abaye Rabbi Shimon. Now, uh, now, one second. Let's go back to what Abaye was originally thinking. Abaye originally thought that Rabbi Shimon didn't need to be told that you can do a circumcision when there's tarat on the milah because. He, he would say that's unintended. So according to that, though, in his original thought, hai besar mai avile. What did he think that Rabbi Shimon would do with that extra word basar? Because it says besar or lato, the flesh of the foreskin. You don't need the extra word basar. So what did he think Rabbi Shimon was going to do with that originally? So Amar Rav Amram, Rav Amram says, Be'omer lakut baher tohu mitkaven. If the person said, I am, I'm doing it on purpose. In other words, the guy said, I'm going for a brit milah. Let's say a non-Jew comes and he says, I want to convert and I want to, you know, but that would be different because he's not Jewish yet. But let's say a Jew never had a circumcision and he's thinking to himself, you know what, I'm going to become religious now because I have tzara'at and uh, I have tzara'at on that area and I want to do the brit milat to remove the tzara'at. I have an excuse because I can remove it on purpose. So there it's intentional, right? So you might say, well, this guy's in- he wants it. He wants to remove the baharat. He wants to remove the, uh, the uh, tzara'at. So we should say that he can't do it now. So that's why Rabbi Shimon really needs a pasuk. In, in, the, in the case of an adult, you can't do it anyway, even if you... Uh... Yeah, for Tarat, of course you could. No, no. Not for Shabbat. Not you for can't Shabbat. over Shabbat. Oh, okay. so that, right. This is only Tarat, right? Tarat. So Tenach Gadol, that makes sense for a Gadol. In other words, so in other words, Abaye was thinking that Rabbi Shimon would apply this pasuk in what case? In a case where the person intentionally wanted to remove the Tarat. There, Rabbi Shimon needs a special dispensation to allow you to do it even when you want that. Okay? Certainly when you don't want it. He wouldn't need that according to Rabbi Shimon. But the problem is, Tenach Gadol Katan Ma'ikel Memar. But what about a child? In other words, in the case of a child, it also says Basar. Mm-hmm. So why should, it, why should a child need it? The child that's eight days old is not thinking, I really need to remove this Tara'at. He doesn't know the difference. So, uh, so the answer is, Amar Be'omer la, so, so, what, so uh, Amar Rab Mishar Shiam Rab Mishar says, Be'omer Avia Ben Lakot Be'erto. Be'erto de Beno. Who commit kaven? So uh, that's where the father says, you know what? I don't like the fact that my son has tarat on his body. I want to cut off. So in other words, the father there is the one removing the tarat. So when it's an adult, he's removing his own. You know, he's responsible for his own. And when it's a child, the father wants to remove it. So but still, in that case, let's say the father says, I really want to perform the circumcision on my son. And I also want to remove the tzarat as I'm doing it because it's on the place of the milah. Okay? So what does he have? He has intention to do it. So, that, but wait a second. We usually have a principle that when can one, when can a positive mitzvah override a negative? Only.
only when there's no alternative. There's no way you can fulfill both. But here you could fulfill both. Why? Because I can get someone else to do the circumcision. The other person doesn't care whether the child has tarat or not. They're just doing the circumcision. If I, the father, do it, so now, and I want the tarat to be removed, so I'm intentionally violating the prohibition of removing the tarat by performing the brit milah. I could get somebody else who it doesn't matter to them whether the tzarat is removed or not. Okay? And, and that person could perform the Brit Milan. and they won't really be violating the prohibition because this is again going like the assumption that even an inevitable consequence is not a concern. But is it the father? Doesn't the father have the responsibility for... No, because the Bet Din could do it. The Bet Din could do it. If the father is there? Um, or um, yeah, n- normally not. But in this case, since the father is going to have to violate a prohibition purposely in order to fulfill the mitzvah of Brit Milah, mm-hmm. so he's going to, uh, you know, he, he wants to get to, someone else will take over so it won't be on him at all. There won't be his shuriah. Anymore. Right. The bed din will do it. So what's... But if you, if you have, say, a boy will do it instead of, the fa- instead of this father who wishes to talk to be removed. Right. Acting as, as that, that's what right. That's exactly what Avram asked. Yeah. So this would be talking about where the bet din did it because the father can't do it without having that intention, right? But the but but this is all counterfactual, hypothetical. Why? Because it's all counterfactual, hypothetical. Because this is all going according to the position that Rebbe Shimon um, holds that even an inevitable consequence is you're exempt for, and that you would have to actually want it for uh, to be responsible for it. Okay, well, and, but that's not actually what the halacha is. The halacha right. is actually that Rabbi Shimon says that if it's inevitable, you're re- you're responsible anyway. So you wouldn't need a complicated case where really he does want it, and therefore the whole thing. So the Gemara says bideleka acher. So if it were true, in other words, if according to Rabbi Shimon you had to intend to remove the tzara'at in order to be liable, then and and then what? Dis- where would you need a special dispensation where the father is removing the, the, the is performing the brit milah and also wants to remove the tzarat from his son? So then, how come he doesn't delegate it to somebody else, or how come the bet din doesn't remove it from him and make somebody else do it? The answer is bedelek acher. There's nobody else competent to perform brit milah. It happens to be that this father is a mohel. Okay, he's the only person who can do it, and therefore you need a special dispensation. But in the end, you don't really need a special dispensation for Rabbi Shimon because Rabbi Shimon follows the same halacha as everyone else. Once the consequence is inevitable, you're equally responsible whether you wanted it or not. So you wouldn't would need this convoluted issue. That, what wouldn't that make, would a make a difference? difference? Because even if somebody else uh, does it, he does it for the father. Well, that's what that's what he was saying. But right. no, because a bet din can sometimes do it, not for the father. Let's say the father says, "I don't want it." I'm a, I'm a, I'm a kofir bator, I don't want it. So the bed will come, they'll circumcise the child. Yeah, but against case, the father. The, 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 in this case, the father says, I want it and I want it for this. But he's not appointing so, the agent. The bed comes and says, you're out, go away. Sure you out. Okay. Yeah, I take see. you out of the picture. All right? But it's all hypothetical because really Rabbi Shimon doesn't need that case for his halakha to apply. All right, so now let's go fight further a little bit. All right, so the... Um, uh, okay, so but like Akhir. So Amar Mar, the master said, Yom Tov ena docha ela bizmana. So Brit Mila only override, overrides Yom Tov if it's being performed bizmana bilvad on the eighth day, just like Shabbat. It can only override. So if you delay a Brit Mila because of jaundice or something like that, you cannot perform the delayed Brit Mila on Yom Tov or Shabbat. So how do we know this? Mina Hanemile, how do we know that? Amar Chizkia, Chizkia said, Vachin Tanad Vechizkia, and this is what the Yeshiva of Chizkia also said. Amar Kra the Pasuk says, Lo to tiro mi menu ad boker. It says, You must not leave. The Korban Pesach over till the morning. She'en Talmud Lomar Ad Boker. Ma Talmud Lomar Ad Boker. Baha Katuv Liten Lo Boker Sheni Lisrefato. The Pasuk actually says, Velot Loto Tiro Mimeno Ad Boker. Don't leave the Korban Pesach over until the morning. Vaha Notar Mimeno Ad Boker Baesh Tisrofo. And whatever is left over until the morning, burn it. So it says Ad Boker twice, until the morning twice. Why does it say until the morning twice? To give you a second morning to burn it. Which means to say, whatever meat was left over from the Korban Pesach on the night of the Yom Tov, the Seder night, that was when they ate the Korban Pesach, you have to burn it. But you don't burn it on Yom Tov. You wait till the next morning of Cholam Moed to burn it. Okay? So that's why it says, Liten Boker Sheni Lisrefato. So true, in the morning of Pesach, it's already, you're not allowed to eat that meat anymore because it passed over the night. But you can't burn it until after Yom Tov. And what that shows you is, any, any kind of melacha 
that's extraneous to Yom Tov because you don't have to do that on Yom Tov. You can wait till afterwards. You don't do it on Yom Tov. So, so you delay it till afterwards. Same thing with Brit Milah. It's not necessary to do it on Yom Tov. You already delayed it. So you wait till after Yom Tov. Abaye, Amar Abaye says, Amar Kara, the Pasuk says, Olat Shabbat B'Shabbatov, Lo Olat Chol B'Shabbat, Lo Olat Chol B'Yom Tov. It says, Olat Shabbat B'Shabbatov, that, that what kind of korban can be offered on Shabbat? Only Olat Shabbat, the offering of Shabbat, which means you can only offer the offering of Shabbat on Shabbat. You can only offer the offering of Yom Tov on Yom Tov. You can't offer an offering. You can't bring a sacrifice from weekday on Shabbat. You can't bring a sacrifice left over from the weekday on Yom Tov. And so to, so to here. This mitzvah was delayed from the weekday till Yom Tov. You can't do the mitzvah on Yom Tov, overriding Yom Tov for this mitzvah. Rava Amar, Rava says, Amar, the Pasuk says, This alone can you do for yourselves. Meaning only melachot on Yom Tov that are for food purposes can you do. This alone. What does that mean? Who who this comes to teach you not preliminaries which means you can't for example sharpen a knife on Yom Tov you can't for example build an oven on Yom Tov even though the purpose of building the oven or sharpening the knife is to prepare food you can't do that because it's preliminary it's not directly involved in the preparation of food and levado velo mila shelo bizmana so you can do, so the word hu levado, this alone can you do. The word this comes to exclude melachot that relate to food but are too remote. They're not the immediate food preparation but they're building an oven or something like that. Yes. And levado teaches you, velo milah shelo bizmana, that you cannot perform a delayed brit milah on Yom Tov. Da'atya mikal vachomer, because normally you would derive it from a kal vachomer, because the act of brit milah overrides Shabbat. The act of brit milah should override Yom Tov, because remember we learned before, because, right, but remember we learned before that just like Brit Milah, that, that according to one view, Brit Milah is actually override, Sarat is actually more severe than Shabbat. And if Milah can override Sarat, it can override Shabbat. So according to that view, it should really be able to, be able to override it even when it's Shalom Bismana. But on all of that, they talk about Brit Mila Bismana. Right, I know, but, right. but according to the logic, in other words, according to the logic that Shabbat is more stringent than Tzara'at, so that, that makes sense that we distinguish between a Mila Bismana and Shalom Bismana, on time and not on time. But according to the view that Tzara'at is actually more stringent than Shabbat, then the fact that Brit Mila any time can override Tzara'at... Brit Milah anytime should also be able to override Shabbat and Yom Tov. So he's coming along to say that no, there's still a halakha that unless it's bizmana, unless it must be on a day, you can't do it. So now the Gemara says, Rav Ashi Amar Rav Ashi says, Shabbaton asehu, vahava de Yom Tov, ase velot aseven, ase doche, lot et lot aseve ase. That the reason is because Yom Tov is actually both a positive and a negative commandment. Brit Milah is only a positive commandment. Okay, and, and even though any time you do the Brit Milah, even if it's delayed, the Brit Milah is still a positive commandment, it can't override Yom Tov because when you override Yom Tov, you're overriding a positive and a negative. The positive is Shabbaton, you should rest on Yom Tov. The negative is don't do Malachan Yom Tov. So you're actually overriding two commandments with the one. And that's why you can't do it. If it's Bismana, there's a special dispensation. But any other time, you might say, oh, why not? It's a positive mitzvah. Override Yom Tov. No, nope. because it's overriding both a positive and a negative in that case. So now we said, Rabbi Akiva basically set a rule. This rule's from the Mishnah because we had a machloka between Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Eliezer said, any preparation, any preliminary necessary for the Brit Milah, override Shabbat. Even if you have to make, even if you have to sharpen the knife, for the Berit Milah. Even if you have to make a knife for the Berit Milah. Even if you have to make charcoal to light a fire to, make, to melt down metal to make the knife for the Berit Milah. It's okay. Okay? Anything is okay. Rabbi Akiva says, no. Anything you could do from before Shabbat, you can't do on Shabbat. And that's the halacha. Only what's immediately necessary for the performance. But anything that's a preliminary, you're not allowed to do. And that holds for what you were talking about before the reference to Shabbat preparation. Right. So, for example, Rabbi Eliezer would allow you to, let's say, carry the knife if you had to on, in a public domain on Shabbat. 
but uh, Rabbi Akiva would not allow you to do that. Now, um, so now we said, Amar Rabbi Yudah, Amar Rav, Halakha ki Rabbi Akiva, the Halakha follows Rabbi Akiva, that only the immediate performance of Barit Milah overrides Shabbat, not preliminary activities. Utnan nami gabe Pesach, ki hai gavna, we had the exact same issue by Pesach. Kalal Amar Rabbi Akiva, kol malachah she'efshar la la sotah be'erev Shabbat, ena docha et ha-Shabbat. Okay, she'chita she'efshar la sotah be'erev Shabbat, docha et ha-Shabbat. That any malachah, let's say the 14th of Nisan falls out on Shabbat. So that means Pesach is Saturday night. The Korban Pesach has to be brought on the 14th of Nisan. Now the 14th of Nisan is what we call today Erev Pesach, okay? The day before the holiday, but it falls out on Shabbat. Now any melacha necessary for that Korban has to be done, even though it's Shabbat. Because that's the day of the Korban. There's no way around it. You must do it. But anything that could be done another day beforehand can't be done on Shabbat. So are they saying that if you don't have what is necessary to, uh, you know, at the time of the Mila uh, you, and you cannot do the Brit Mila because you can't do the Brit Mila without a knife then you don't do the Brit Mila? You um, have to do the Brit Mila when you don't have... Right, if you don't have the knife, you would have to buy... So there's issues of like, well, can you have a non-Jew bring the knife or whatever. There's other ways are possibly around it. But if you can't, then you don't do Then you the don't do it. That's it. Shabbat comes, you know, you can only violate Shabbat in the actual performance of the Mila. Nothing else leading up to the Mila. And as we're going to see, what post needs can also violate Shabbat Didn't for. We just learned two, two, the, two pages ago that there's a machlok about carrying the knife... With a cover, without a cover. Yeah, but only in a chatzer and but everything. A, okay. Or, still. or according to Rabbi Eliezer, according to Rabbi Eliezer, you're allowed to carry. Right. Right. But according to Rabbi Akiva, you're not allowed to, because you're because you could carry before. So here, what we're saying is that on, when when this time of, of offering the korban pesach happens on Shabbat, you can't, for example, Rashi says, bring it chutz latchum, bring it from outside the tchum on Shabbat. You can't, you know, bring it further than you're allowed to travel. You can't cut off a uh, a, a mum that could be removed. You can't do surgery on your animal to remove a defect to make it. Kasher. So you can't do anything that could have been done before Shabbat. But anything that must be done on Shabbat, like the slaughtering of the Korban, has to be done on the right day. You can't do it before. Okay, so that's what Rabbi Akiva says over there. So, and there too, Amar Rabbi Yehuda, Amar Rav, Halakha Rabbi Akiva. The Halakha follows Rabbi Akiva. There's two, Utsricha, and you need both cases. De'iyash me'inan gabi mila hatam hu demachshirin efshar lasot me'etmol. Lo da'chu Shabbat, de'leke karet. Aval Pesach de'ke karet ema lid'chu Shabbat. Because why do you need to be told? It's the same principle. That when you have a mitzvah on that day, you can only do the things that override, and, and that mitzvah overrides Shabbat. You can only do the mitzvah to the extent necessary, the, extre- the immediate performance. You can't do the preliminary preparations on Shabbat. So why do you need to tell me that on Korban Pesach and also Brit Milah? Just tell me one. I get the point. So you need both. Why? Because if I told you only by Pesach, you might think that, okay, Brit Milah, I'm sorry, if I told you only by Brit Milah, you would say, fine. That's because, why can't I do the preparations? Why can't I sharpen the knife according to Rabbi Akiva? Why can't I carry the knife according to Rabbi Akiva? Simply because there's no karet right now. There's no issue of karet, the se- severe penalty of karet, of excision. Because the baby wouldn't get karet, he's only a baby. The adult doesn't get karet for not giving his uh, baby a brit milah. So, it's, so we can do it later. We'll do it after Shabbat. But Pesach, if you neglect to do Korban Pesach, it's a karet right now. Right? There's a pro- that, that's a violation of karet if you neglect to do the Korban Pesach. So maybe we would allow you even to violate Shabbat for the preparations. That's why it has to tell you no. And the Yashmin and Gabi Pesach Mushum de Lanech to Allah Yud Gimel Beritot, Aval Milad Rechut to Allah Yud Gimel Beritot, Emal Lit Chushabat Tzricha. And alternatively, if Rabbi Akiva only told us this limitation by Pesach, that on, when it comes to the Korban Pesach, you can only do the actual performance of the sacrifice, but you can't do the preliminaries. So I might say, well, that's because Pesach is just one mitzvah. But Berit Milah, there were 13 covenants made on Berit Milah. The word berit is mentioned 13 times with respect to berit milah. It's very, very significant. So you might think there will override Shabbat even for the preliminaries. So therefore he has to tell you that in neither case, even though there's a stringency, by Pesach there's a stringency that there's karet immediately. By berit milah there's a stringency that there are 13 beritot. And yet in both cases Rabbi Akiva says that when the Torah gives you a dispensation to override Shabbat for this mitzvah, it's only for the performance of the mitzvah itself. It's not for any of the preparations or preliminaries that are necessary. Because there's also karet for violating the Shabbat. So that's right, the that's true too. Itself. That's true. Now the new Mishnah says, Osin kol torche milah b'Shabbat. So the, the kamun. So it says you can do all the needs of the Milan Shabbat. 
what is that? What are all the needs? All the actual performance needs. So, what can you do? Mo'alin, you can cut off the foreskin. Pour in. If you've ever watched a Brit Milah, you would know that not only do they cut off the foreskin, but they also take the, uh, the skin from around the top of the, uh, of the head of the penis as well. So it's not, just a, um, it's not just the foreskin, but it's also that skin underneath that's called Puriyah. Both steps are absolutely necessary. Uh, Mila without Puriyah is nothing. So you have to do both. So they're both necessary. And actually, as we're going to learn a little bit later in the Masechet, it goes into more of the details of the Halachot of Brit Milah. But that's why you've, you see that the Mohel doesn't just cut. He also has what to about, remove. What about Mitzit Sabapay? But that's here. That's Motzitzin. Motzitzin is you can also, you have to suck the blood out of the wound, so which is what they would do. Necessary. This is where it's from. Okay, this is where the whole controversy about the mitzitah that's going on in New York with the new law that they passed, that you have to sign a waiver. This is, this is where the idea is that you have to do mitzitah, that you have to suck the blood out of the wound because they believed at that time, for medical reasons, that if you didn't suck the blood out of the wound, that, it would ca- that would cause harm, irreparable harm to the baby. And the waiver is okay? because, the waiver is because, they're pre- because some kids got herpes from, yeah. not the, Mo- you know, not sexually transmitted herpes, you know, mouth transmitted herpes from a Mo'alim that had, you know, because you can have the virus in your mouth. You can have a canker sore. It's a herpes virus. You know, you, you give it to somebody. Um, and, and the babies, a couple of babies, you know, sadly, you know, they, they die. There were fatalities. So, they, so Bloomberg, you know, pushed through a law. Basically, they have to sign a waiver. So a lot of the Haredim were very upset about it because they said it's a part of our holy tradition. It's in the Mishnah. It's in the Gemara. Uh, but, the, uh, but, you know, I think it's a good compromise. As long as people sign the waiver, it's no problem. A lot of people use a tube now instead of actually directly putting the mouth right. on the wound. They use a tube. Right. So it's a better, it's a better uh, method. But, you know, the real hardcore Haredim say any, tradition, any change in the way that they've always done it, they don't like it. So, you know, that's, that's the issue. And you can put a wound, you can put a bandage on it of a kamun, and uh, you can put uh, uh, um, what's kamun in, in English? Cumin, right? Cumin. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't think of the word. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Imlo shachat mir Shabbat. What happens if you didn't grind the cumin before Shabbat? So you can't grind spices on Shabbat. So then lo es b'shinav v'noten. Then you chew it and you put it on. V'imlo taraf So again, they didn't understand apparently. You know the uh, how many germs are in your saliva because they used the mouth for all these things that we would today consider highly unsanitary and requiring uh, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, sanitary. You know. Sp- when we sterilize things, you know, but they didn't have that. So you would chew it with your teeth. And they would also make out of wine and oil, they would make kind of a salve to put on the wound. So they, you weren't allowed to mix that on Shabbat because you're not allowed to beat eggs on Shabbat. And you're not allowed to beat like, um, because just like you're not allowed to beat eggs because it looks like cooking, you're not allowed to beat like oil and, and wine together into a mixture because it's like a type of preparation for cooking or it looks that way. It's rabbinically prohibited. Did so you, you apply salad? each one separately. Did you make salad dressing? Um, salad dressing uh, with oil. Yeah, I guess you could shake it probably. Shake it, but you can't stir. Yeah, you can't stir. Okay. Shaken but not stirred. Okay. okay. James Bond. Okay. Um, so... Uh, yeah, they used to make like a little glove that would go over the, the penis as a sort of uh, bandage. So you're not allowed to make that on Shabbat because you're actually fashioning a new thing. However, but you can wrap a bandage around it as long as you don't fashion something into a shape on Shabbat. If you forgot to leave the bandage in the place where the Brit Milah is taking place, you can put it on your finger and wear it uh, even from one courtyard to another. In other words, even in a place where you normally wouldn't be allowed to carry on Shabbat, you can wear it on your finger and transport it to where the baby's going to be so it can be placed on the baby. And the reason why they put this bandage on was because they were worried that, the, that, the, that parts of the orla would grow back if they didn't put a tight bandage over the, the place of the breed. Now, nowadays, we do put the gauze and everything to prevent infection and to uh, help it heal quicker. They were more concerned about um, it growing back and preventing it from growing back, according to Rashi. Now we turn to Amud Bet. The Gemara says, You mention in the Mishnah all of the needs of Mila. Uh, cutting the, the, the foreskin, uh, removing the skin underneath. So what does it mean, You mentioned all the needs of the Mila. So what does all the needs of Mila come to add? Why does the Mishnah have to say, you can do all the necessary steps in Mila and then list all of them? So what does all the necessary steps come to include? It's a superfluous phrase. So to include what it says in the Mishnah. This is a famous halakha that has many applications. Which means as follows. 
when you're doing a Brit Milah, there are two things. There's what's called the Tzitzina Me'akvin and Tzitzin She'enan Me'akvin, which means there are parts of the, uh, of the piece of foreskin that's removed that if they're not removed are called Tzitzina uh, Me'akvin. They are called the parts that are Me'akev. Without removing them, you have not done the mitzvah at all. Okay, and later on it explains that Hamakvin means that if there's a majority of the the in other words, if the majority of the uh, of the head of the penis is still covered by Orla, even if you took some of it off, you haven't done Brit Milah. So that's called Me'akvin. What's left is Me'akev. It's still holding back the fulfillment of the mitzvah. Enan Me'akvin means you got 75 or 80 percent of it. You left a little bit. Okay, so that's not me'akev. It doesn't prevent the fulfillment of the mitzvah. The mitzvah has still been done because you did the, va- the vast majority. Okay, so now what the Gemara is saying is, it's quoting this Tosefta that says, as long as you're involved in the milah, even on Shabbat. So you might say, oh, it's Shabbat. I should only remove the amount that I need to remove to fulfill the mitzvah, just 51%. No. As long as you're involved in the Brit Milah, remove anything. You can remove the entire thing, even what's not necessary, what's not indispensable. But once you remove your hand, in other words, if you did 60% and said, I just got to rest my arm for a second, and then you go back, nope, it's Shabbat. The other 40% is not me'akev. It's not necessary for the mitzvah. Leave it. That's the halacha. So the Gemara asks, Amar Rabba Barbarchana. Rabba Barbarchana asks, oh, I'm sorry, Mantana Peresh in Ochozer. Who is the one who says that when you stop doing a mitzvah and you go back to it, it's like a new performance? So since it's like a new performance, that's why you can't do it on Shabbat. Because on Shabbat, you're given a dispensation to do the Brit Milah once. You're not given a dispensation to do it twice. So going back to it is not, once you take a break, going back is considered like a new activity. And you don't have a permission on Shabbat to do that new activity. You only had a permission for the first activity. So who is the one that says a similar concept? So Amar Rabbi Barachana. Amar Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Barachana said that Rabbi Yochanan said, Rabbi Yishmael ben Rabbi Yochanan ben Berokah. It's, Rabbi, it's the opinion of Rabbi Yishmael, the son of Rabbi Yochanan ben Berokah, that we learned earlier in the Masechet. This is going to be familiar to you. The Tanya, as we learned in a Baraita. When the 14th of Nisan falls on Shabbat, Mafshita Pesach HaDechazet Dever Rabbi Yishmael ben Oshel Rabbi Yochanan ben Berokah. The Chachamim Omrim Mafshitin et Kulo. Now remember, this was a machlok that we had earlier in the Masechet, that according to, that when you are, when, when Erev Pesach is on Shabbat, so you have to bring the Korban Pesach on Shabbat, and you have to put the Emurin, you have to open up the Korban Pesach, take out its innards and put them on the altar on Shabbat. So according to Rabbi Yishmael Ben Oshel, Rabbi Yochan Ben Barokah, you can only skin it up to the chest. Because that's all you need to skin it. You don't need to skin the whole thing. The Chachamim say, no, you can skin the entire thing. And Rashi explains that when you skin it, you first skin it up to the chest, then you remove the innards, and then you finish skinning according to the Chachamim. So according to the Chachamim, not only did you do skinning that wasn't necessary, you actually skinned the necessary part, took a break from it, and then went back. So that's exactly what you're doing in the Brit Milah. You're doing the Brit Milah, you did 60%, you did what was absolutely necessary, you left, and you came back. And the Chachamim are saying, it's fine. Rabbi Ishmael is saying, no, you can only do it up to the chest because once you did it up to the chest, you finished what you needed to do, you removed it, you stopped already, now you can't go back. So the Gemara is saying there's an analogy here. He's saying you can't go back. Once you interrupt it, you can't go back. So the Gemara says it's not a good analogy. Why not? Me might. Because Maybe Rabbi Ishmael Rabbi Yochanan ben Beroka only said that over there. He only was stringent in the case of the Korban Pesach. Why? Because we have an idea. This is my God and I will glorify him. Which means do mitzvot in a beautiful way. Now once you've removed the emurin, once you've removed the innards from this Korban Pesach, it doesn't have to be beautiful anymore. Because it doesn't have any more function on the altar anymore. You took the parts that you need. So therefore there's no more, there's no more in requirement or mandate to make it beautiful. So you don't have to finish skinning it. Leave it partially skinned, no problem. But a breed milah, you're going to live with that the rest of your life. If it doesn't look nice, it's no good. No, okay? You can, also, you, well, can cut it you can do it later, but you want to do that? Did you want to do that? Are you asking? Nobody wants to do that. My nephew was done. Yeah, it's done. Sometimes they have to redo. It's true. <laughs> Unfortunately, sometimes they have to redo. But let's, let's assume yeah. nobody wants to do that. They want it to be beautifully done. So therefore, you could say that I'm still, even though I took a break from the mitzvah, 
I didn't complete the mitzvah in a certain respect. I completed the mitzvah in a technical respect in terms of removing orla, but there's this, there's an idea that the product should be a beautiful product, and therefore I have a mandate to continue. Rabbi Ishmael, so, so Rabbi Ishmael <coughs> might still say you're allowed to do it here. And where do we get this idea of beautification? Because the Tanya says in the Veu, this is my God, I will glorify him. Make yourself beautiful with your mitzvot. Make a beautiful sukkah. A beautiful lulav. A beautiful shofar. A nice tzitzit. Sefer Torah. And a beautiful Sefer Torah. The Katuv. Uchetovbo. Lishmo. Bidayone. And when you write it, and you should write in it. For the sake of his name, with very nice dio, which ver- with very nice ink. Okay, bedio na'eh, bekulmus na'eh, with a nice pen, belavlar uman, with a professional scribe. The korcho bishra'ina'in, and you should wrap it in nice wrappings. In other words, you might say, God doesn't care about aesthetics. Right? He doesn't live in Soho. Right? Who are we trying to impress here? Why do we have to have aesthetics? The answer is, we want the mitzvot to be aesthetically beautiful. It says, make the mitzvah aesthetically beautiful. Don't just have a passable sukkah. Have a beautiful sukkah. Don't just have a passable sefer Torah. When you're doing it, do every part of it with beauty. Even getting the best professional to write it and so on. Um, that's very important. So, that, so, so too, a brit milah, the product should be beautiful. Don't do a 60% product when you can have 100%. And Abba Sha'ul Omer ve'anvehu means ha'vedomelo. There's another idea in ze'elev anvehu. This is my God ve'anvehu, which according to Abba Sha'ul, it comes from the, con- the combination of the words ani vahu ve'anvehu. Have it be like him. Mahu chanun ve'rachom. Af'ata ye rachom chanun. Chanun ve'rachom. Just like he is merciful and gracious, you should be merciful and gracious. In other words, I want to be like him. So when you say, it means, this is my God. I will be like him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to emulate him. Okay? But anyway, the idea of a perfect product is definitely, an aesthetically beautiful product is a concept in the Torah. So therefore, Rabbi Ishmael, we can't, we can't conclude that Rabbi Ishmael ben Oshel, Rabbi Yochanan ben Brokha is going to prevent you from going back to finish the extras of the Brit Milah here. We can't prove it. So let's look for another Tana who holds like this. So uh, the Gemara says, Ela Amar Ravashi Ravashi says, Hamani Rabbi Yosei, he it's Rabbi Yosei. Tetznanas, we learned in a Mishnah, Ben Shani Rabbi Alil, Ben Shani Loni Rabbi Alil, Mechalin Allah Vita Shabbat. This is a famous Mishnah from Masachet Rosh Hashanah. The halacha is, if you happen to see the new moon appear on Shabbat, now you're supposed to go as a witness. In those days, how did they determine the Rosh Chodesh? Witnesses. If you saw the moon, you were obligated to go to the Bet Din immediately, even on Shabbat. Even if you had to get on your horse and go t- 25 miles to the Beit Din in Yerushalayim, you had to go. And the Chachamim say, if you saw it, even if it was near Abba Alil, which means it was so clear that you know everybody saw it, but you saw it, right? So you're obligated to go. Even though you know that somebody in Yerushalayim saw it, so why should I bother going? The answer is, once you see it, it's your mitzvah now. You have to go. That's what the Chachamim say. Rabbi Yossi says, no. Rabbi Yossi Omer, Nira ba'alil in machalin lavata Shabbat. You don't have to go if it was obvious. If it's so clear, the new moon appeared, and you know that people in Yerushalayim saw it. So you don't need to go. They're not going to need you. So you don't have to go. You don't have to violate Shabbat to get there. Okay? Now what's the analogy here? They're saying that this is Rabbi Yosei. So what's Rabbi Yosei here? How does this connect to Brit Milah? It connects to Brit Milah because, because according to the Rashi says, Afal gav ika mitzvah. Even though there's a mitzvah involved in going back in and clearing up the Brit Milah and making it perfect, just like there's a mitzvah involved in going and testifying in the Bet Din, even so... Um, Kevan de la litzorech gavoahu. Since it's not needed, tzorech gavoah, the needs of, of heaven, so to speak, are not being served. Lo mechalalinan. Okay? In other words, you might feel that you have a personal mandate to go and testify in the Bet Din, but the fact is you're not needed. So you don't have a, a, a license to do it. So too, you might want to complete the Brit Milah, but it's not necessary. So you can't rely on the, you know, what you did before was necessary. It's not necessary, so you can't do it. So you might say that Rabbi Yossi is the one. But still, again, it's not a perfect analogy because There's a, there's a difference here too. Because when it comes to the Rosh Chodesh, you saw Rosh Chodesh, you saw the new moon, and you saw that it was so clear that you know everybody saw it. So you never had an obligation to go to violate Shabbat. It's not like you're violating Shabbat up to a certain point. You're not doing it at all. But the Brit Milah, you had permission to violate Shabbat to, to do the Brit Milah. So maybe you can complete the job. 
Nobody else was. Right, nobody else was. Yeah. that if it was not Shabbat, then, in, mm -hmm. in the same situation... Then you would go back. No, but then you would not have the, the obligation. Let's say you, if, if the, the, the moon was clear and you knew for sure... That everyone was going to Then it, it would then, even if it wasn't Shabbat... It would sound like then you would go, because the only issue is you can't override Shabbat no, to go. When you know that you're not needed. When you know you're not needed. In other words, it's a mitzvah, so on a weekday, maybe you go. But on, a, but on Shabbat, you don't have the right to violate Shabbat unless it's needed. So it's still an obligation. It's a mitzvah, but you don't do it. So it's at a, di a different level. That's why he's saying, so that, that's why he's saying here, the analogy. That with Brit Milah, it's a mitzvah to make it a perfect Brit Milah, but it's not an obligation. It's not necessary. So you can't do it. But the difference is that over there, it's not necessary at all. Here, you had a dispensation. We're, we're arguing not about whether you're violating Shabbat or not, but how much you're violating Shabbat. It's a different type of question by the Brit Milah. It's a different question because over there we're saying yes or no. Here we're saying how much. So now the Gemara gives another suggestion of an analogy that this one sticks. Ela amrei nehar Rather, the people of nehar of nehar said, Rabbanan de pligei alei de rabbiosihi. It's actually the rabbis who argue with rabbiosi who are the basis here. Because it's not we have a very uh, another classic mishnah. This classic mishnah is talking about the lechem apanim. The lechem apanim were the two stacks of bread that you've often seen on the shulchan in the mishkan. You know the two stacks of twelve loaves, six and six. So it says it has to be lefanai tamid, always on the table, always on the shulchan. So how do you have always? You have to remove every Shabbat. They had to remove it and replace. So how do you do always if you have to remove and replace? So here's how they did it. Tanu Rabbanan, the rabbis taught that the way they got around this problem was ditznan. I'm sorry, it doesn't say ten Rabbanan. It says ditznan as it learned in the Mishnah. Arba akwanim nechnasin shnei biadam shnei sederim shnei biadam shnei bazichin. Four kwanim came on one side. Two of them had the two sets of bread, you know, the two sets of loaves, and two had the two spoons of frankincense. For arba'a makdim in the and two went in front of them. Shnei litol shnei sederim shnei litol shnei bazichin, and then they had four people to remove the old. In other words, the bread and the and the frankincense was there from last Shabbat. It would now be removed for the kwanim to eat and replaced with new bread for this Shabbat. So when they so four people came to remove the two spoons of frankincense. The two spoons of frankincense go on the altar to be burned, and the twelve loaves from last week go to the kohanim, and the twelve new loaves go for the next for the upcoming week. So the new people who are bringing the bread stand to the north, facing the south. And the ones that are taking away the old bread stand in the south, facing the north. Now what they did was. Was they they were both on the table at the same time. So as as they slid the old one a tefach away, they slid the new one a tefach onto the table. Slid it another tefach, slid in another one. So there was never a moment that the bread wasn't on the table because as one was being slid off a hand breadth at a time, the other one was being slid on a hand breadth at a time. So it was continuous without a break. But Rabbi Yossi says, Rabbi Yossi says, you guys are being too literal here. You guys are too literal. It doesn't mean literally always. It means that if you, even if you took one off and you immediately put the other one back, in other words, you took the old one off and then you put the new one on. It's also tamid. It's always. It's always on there. For, in other words, Nechtamid. Right, yeah. yeah. Similar with Nechtamid. Maybe similar, yeah. yeah. That's right. So when you remove it, I mean, uh, it's only for one second. It's going to go right back on. So he says, that's also Tamid. So there was a break for a minute, but you were in the process of putting the other one. So it's no problem. So similarly, the chacha, so you could apply the same machloket here. That according to Rabbi Yossi, what would he say? As soon as you, uh, that if, even if you took a break in the middle of the Brit Milah and you wanted to go back, ah, it's still, you're still involved in it. It's still Tamid. It's still continuous. Even though what you're do doing now is finishing up non-essential components of the Brit, it doesn't matter. The Chachamim would say, if you take a break even for a, mi a minute, just like if you took a break and you took the bread off of the table and then put the new bread on, it would be considered an interruption. So, so too here, once you remove your hand from the Brit Milah and you now want to go back to finish up the non-essential components, you can't do it anymore. It's not a continuous action anymore. And according to the Chachamim, it has to be a continuous action. So that's an, analog an analogous case to our case. Tanu Rabbanan, the rabbi's taught, mehal kitin etamila. Ve'im lo hilkit 
Anosh Karet. It says you have to finish off all the parts of the Milah. In other words, you have to finish off all the essential components. And if you didn't Chayav Karet, you, you, you get Karet for that. In other words, you didn't do Brit Milah at all. Don't think I did some Brit Milah. No, it has to be that you removed all the essential parts. All the essential parts of the foreskin must be removed in order for it to qualify. There's no partial in that respect. So Mani, who is the author of this statement? Amar Rav Kahana, Rav Kahana said, I'm sorry, Mani, who is the one who gets the Karet? Amar Rav Kahana, Rav Kahana says, Uman, the, the, uh, the Mohel gets Karet, because he didn't do his job. Wait a second, really? So then he disagrees with what, the 75%. Right, so Matkivla, no, no, we're talking about in the, in other words, let's say you even j- just did 40%. You only remove forty okay. percent. So the Gemara is saying, then you're going to get karet. That's no good. That's not even. It's not even a majority. So what is the? Uh, and we're talking about coverage of the of the head of the of the penis. We're not talking about the amount of foreskin. We're talking about the coverage. So it might not be the same quantity. Um, so I'm, so Matkifler of Papa of Papa says Uman le the, the what are you talking about? The Mohel will just say to them Ana avde palga. The mitzvah atun of the two palga the mitzvah. I did half the mitzvah. You finish it. Why does he get karet? Because he only did half the mitzvah. Let somebody else finish the rest of the mitzvah. Why does he have to do the whole thing? Where does it say that? So therefore, Ela Amar Papa Papa says gadol. It means an adult when an adult circumcises himself. If he only did forty percent of the milah, he didn't do it at all. So he's still under the karet excision from the Jewish people for not doing a brit milah, for not being circumcised. So Matkifa Ravashi, Ravashi raised an objection to him. He said, what are you talking about? Gadol be'ed yakitiv bo, kitiv be va'arel zachar. We know from the Torah that an uncircumcised person gets karet, is cut off from the Jewish people. Why do you have to tell me that in a rabbinic statement? It's in the Torah. And I know if he only did a 40% job, he didn't do it at all. So what's the, what's the novelty here? What's the chidush here? So they say, they answered, va'am, so the answer is, very interesting case. We knew that already. So Ela Amar Ravashi Ravashi says Le Odam Uman. We're really talking about the Mohel. O Kegon de Ata Ben Hashem Ashod de Shabbat Va Amru Le Lo Mis Pakat. And he and what happened was he came on Shabbat and he was late to do the Brit Milah, and there were only a few minutes left of Shabbat. Now the Brit Milah to be considered a Milah Bismana has to be completed on Shabbat. Let's say the eighth day with Shabbat he has to do it on Shabbat, and they said to him, "You're not going to have enough time." Okay? Lo misapakt. You're not going to have enough time to complete the job. And Vamar the one, he says, No! Misapkina, I have plenty of time. I'm going to be able to do it. But what actually happened? Ve'avad, velo istapak. And he did it and he didn't finish. Vishtakach, de chaburahu, de avad, ve'anush karet. It doesn't mean that he's going to be getting the punishment of karet for not doing the Brit Milah. Because someone else could do the Brit Milah. Or the person who has the Brit Milah can fix it when they get to become an adult. But what did he do? He violated Shabbat. Because the only dispensation to, uh, to, to do Brit Milah is when you're actually doing the mitzvah. This guy thought he was a hot shot. He was going to do a speed Brit Milah at the last second. He didn't finish the job. He only got 40% done. And then the sun goes down and Shabbat is over. Yeah. So he never finished the job, but now he still has to go back and finish the Brit Milah because it still has to be done. But the point is that his Shabbat violation was just a Shabbat violation without any justification because what he actually did on Shabbat wasn't a mitzvah. All he did was make a wound in the child because he only did 30-40% of the job. So now we get to the mitzitzah thing. We're going uh, uh, we're gonna to look at that for a second. Motzitzin, Amar Papa Papa says, and this is where the, the controversy comes. Hai umana de sakana. Any mohel that doesn't do mitzitzah, who doesn't take the blood out, suck the blood out of the wound, it's a danger. Sakanahu va'abrinan le, and we fire him. We don't allow him to serve as a mohel. So you see why they're so particular about this, because it says in the Talmud, it's really important. Okay, so pshita, this is obvious. Midikam mechalale ale shabbata sakanahu. Now, if the Mishnah tells you that you can violate Shabbat for sucking the blood out of this wound, obviously it must be considered life and death. Must be considered pikuach nefesh. Otherwise, how could they allow you to do it? So, what is he coming to tell you? Obviously. So, what might you have thought? Hi, dam mifkad paked. You might have thought that the blood is somehow caught inside. In other words, Rashi explains what does it mean uh, that it, that it's caught inside. He says that kanatun bakli en chabura kan isur Torah. That what's you might have thought? What's the reason why they allow you to suck the blood out on Shabbat? Because it's actually encased in a special sort of place inside the baby's body, and it's not considered a wound at all. All he's doing is is facilitating the exit of the blood from the body, but it's not actually making of a wound at all. 
Okay, it's not considered absorbed blood. It's considered to be like contained in a container and it's just coming out. And that's why you're allowed to do it on Shabbat, but it's not really that big of a deal. It's not pikuach nefesh. It's not a violation of Shabbat that's only being allowed because of an emergency. It's really just something you're allowed to do. So therefore, he comes along to tell you, no, that it's actually a dangerous thing. It's actually a violation of Shabbat. Kamash malan, chabure mechabar, vedumyad ispalanit vekamun. Ma ispalanit vekamun, ila avid sakanahu. Afa hachanami, ila avid sakanahu. That just like when it comes to the bandage and the salve and everything and the cumin, that it's considered life and death to protect the wound from infection and so on, that you have to do it even if it involves a violation of Shabbat. So to hear, even though metzitza, even though the sucking of the blood out is a violation, of Shabbat. Don't think it's just something harmless. It's not even a violation of Shabbat and we allow you to do it because it's not really a violation of Shabbat, not because it's so important. The opposite is the case. It really is a violation of Shabbat, but it's really, really important. And that's what he had to tell you. That therefore, if a mohel is not doing it, we're going to fire him. And that's why it's considered so significant. Now, this is the last piece we're going to do for today. You put a bandage over it. Amar Abayabai says, Amrali M, my mother told me, is planita de chulon keve shav minai? So she said that the best kind of a isplanit, uh, the best kind of a uh, of a, uh, a, a a bandage for for all of the wounds that you might have, right? So that's isplanita de kulon kevi, any kind of wound that you might have. What's the best kind of bandage? Seven parts fat and one part wax. And you put that over, you mix that together, put that over the wo- wound and you, uh, with a bandage, and that, that's what you put on it. Okay, so that's what, I told, that's what he said. Rava Amar, Rava says, Kira vekalaba rishini, rishina. So what the, Rashi says that what this means is wax with rosin is actually the best salve to put on. Derasha Rava b'machuza. When Rava came to Machuza, he told everybody that if you have a wound, put rosin mixed with wax over your wound, then it's going to heal it really fast. And karinu b'nei manyumei asya lemanayu. All of the doctors in town tore their garments. Why? Because he revealed their secrets. Who's going to go to the doctor if everybody knows what the trick is? Right? They don't have to go to the doctor now. And they can diagnose themselves, treat themselves. So they were very upset. Uh, Marlohoi said to them, don't worry. I left you one thing that I didn't tell them. Damar Shmuel, because Shmuel, who was also a doctor, said, Haimandim Mashe Ape, Filona Giv Tuva, Niktirule Chaspanita, that if a person washes their face but doesn't dry it properly, he's going to break out in boils. Or we might say like acne breakout, you know, if you don't wash, if you don't dry your face properly. So, Maita Kante, what is the way to fix it? Limshe Tuva Bemaid Silka, you need to take some beet soup and put it on your face. These are homeopathic remedies here, and that will cure your boils that are broken out. I didn't tell them about that. So since I didn't tell them about that, they'll still have to come to you when they have boils break out on their face. When they have wounds, maybe now they know the trick of how to make a good uh, bandage for a wound, but about their acne and stuff, you know, their boils on their face, that they don't know, and therefore you still can stay in business. You don't have to worry um, about uh, losing money in your profession because there'll be plenty of people knocking at your door anyway. Have a great day.